Hello, and thank you for joining us today for this Edward Jones webinar, How Are My Investments Taxed? My name is Sandy Miller. Before we get going, let me highlight a few of the features on your screen that we're going to be using. On your screen right now, you should already see a video window with me inside. There should be another window with our presentation slides and a third window for our Q&A feature. If for some reason you have any difficulty during the program, you can click on the help icon at the bottom of your screen. That's the black question mark inside the yellow circle. This is for any technical questions you may have. For those watching live, we also have a team on standby ready to assist you if at any time during our discussion you have a question or would like clarification on a point. Just click on the Q&A icon, which is the third button from the left at the bottom of your screen. That will allow you to send in your questions. We will do our best to answer your questions in the allotted time we're given. If your question is not answered, please follow up with your Edward Jones Financial Advisor. If you do not have an Edward Jones Financial Advisor, please click on the Find an FA widget below. We also have a lot of helpful resources and information available for you inside the Resources icon, which is located next to the Q&A icon. And for those who wish to utilize it, closed captioning is available and can be turned on or off at any time during this webinar by clicking on the closed captioning icon. All right, now that you know your way around, let's get started. It's that time of year again, tax season, and we're here to help make it as smooth as possible for you. In this webinar, our panelists will highlight some of the most common investments taxpayers will have, how those investments are taxed, and some tips that can help manage your taxes on those investments. Joining us for today's webinar are Daniel Ladd, a Senior Analyst, Client Needs at Edward Jones, and Elizabeth Anderson, a Senior Analyst, Client Needs, and Certified Financial Professional. And thank you both for being with us today. Dan, let's start off by providing some background on what types of taxes our investments might be subject to. Sandy, thanks for having me on today. That's a great place to start. But let me mention a few quick disclaimers. First, we at Edward Jones do not provide tax advice. However, we do work very closely with many of our clients' tax professionals, and having your tax professional work closely with your financial advisor can be key to maximizing your investment returns. Second, as we go through this webinar, keep in mind that while taxes can play a significant role in investment strategizing, we want to be sure not to let taxes dictate our overall investment strategies. Rather, tax strategizing with investments can be used to keep as much of our returns as possible. But with that in mind, let's dig in. Generally, there are three types of taxes to consider as we discuss investments. First is ordinary income. This is the type of income subject to your marginal tax rate. Next, we have long-term capital gains rates. This is tax on profits from the sale of certain types of assets held for more than one year. For federal tax purposes, this rate is generally lower and therefore more favorable than your marginal income tax rate. For example, if you're in the 37% tax bracket, your capital gains rate is going to be 20%. And finally, for taxpayers whose modified adjusted gross income exceeds certain thresholds, we can face the net investment income tax. This is an additional 3.8% tax applied to certain net investment income. That is, income from certain investments, less applicable investment expenses. Thanks, Dan. That's a great overview. Let's discuss the investments themselves. What investments do taxpayers typically own, and how does that play a role on their tax return? Great question, Sandy. The three most common types of investment income that we typically see taxpayers dealing with include interest income, dividends, and capital gains. So let's first talk about interest income. This is the income that a taxpayer receives from certain types of accounts or for lending money to someone else. This can come in the form of interest on a checking and savings account or certificate of deposit, or interest on a fixed income investment such as a treasury, corporate, or municipal bond. At the federal level, interest is taxed as ordinary income, subject to your marginal tax rate, while at the state level, it is subject to the tax laws imposed by that jurisdiction, as different states have their own rules. However, there are some differences depending on the type of investment. For example, treasury notes and bonds are not taxed at the state level, while municipal bonds are not taxed at the federal level, may or may not be taxed at the state level, and may be subject to the alternative minimum tax, also known as AMT. Now, dividends, on the other hand, are distributions from a company to its shareholders, typically in the form of cash. While often paid out quarterly, dividends can be paid out annually, monthly, or even weekly. 
However, dividends are not required to be paid out by companies, and many choose not to issue dividends at all. When it comes to the taxes on dividends, we're focused on two main types of dividends. That's non-qualified dividends and qualified dividends. Non-qualified dividends are taxed as ordinary income, again, subject to your federal marginal tax rate, whereas qualified dividends are taxed according to your capital gains tax rate. The determination of a dividend's tax status is based on the holding period and type of investment. Now, often, investors will also choose to reinvest dividends to purchase additional shares or fractions of a share of the issuing investment. Keep in mind, reinvested dividends are taxable and are taxed according to the classification as non-qualified or qualified. And lastly, the last type of investment to discuss today is capital gains and losses. This generally represents the difference between the proceeds received from the sale of an investment and the investment's cost basis. The cost basis represents the amount you paid for an investment over time, including the original purchase price, commissions and fees, reinvestments, and corporate actions. In general, if the investment increases over the value over the life you own it, you may have a capital gain. And conversely, if the investment's value decreases over the time you own it, you may have a capital loss. Now, capital gains can be realized in the form of a mutual fund long-term capital gain distribution. These distributions represent your portion of capital gains from investment sales within a mutual fund portfolio. So you could have capital gains in years where you don't personally sell mutual funds or in years where your portfolio decreases in value. The tax applicable to capital gains can be complex, so make sure to speak to a financial advisor or tax professional if more clarity is needed. Now, depending on the holding period and type of investment, your capital gain or loss will be classified as either short-term or long-term. Capital gains are classified as short-term if they are held for one year or less, with net short-term capital gains being taxed as ordinary income, again, subject to your marginal tax rate. On the other hand, in general, capital gains are classified as long-term if you hold the investment for greater than one year, receive a mutual fund capital gain distribution, or inherit the investment. Net long-term capital gains are taxed according to your more favorable long-term capital gains rate. Great overview, Dan. I do want to pause here for a moment to highlight one important feature of capital gains that you mentioned. Different tax rates are applied based on net capital gains. This means before you apply ordinary rates to short-term gains and long-term capital gains rates to long-term gains, you need to net out short-term gains and losses separately from net long-term gains and losses, and then net those results together. This will give us one net short-term or long-term capital gain or loss, and as Dan mentioned, net short-term gains are taxed as ordinary income, while net long-term capital gains are taxed at your long-term capital gains rate. But Dan, what about net long-term or short-term capital losses? Yes, Elizabeth, if the net amount results in a loss, taxpayers can use up to $3,000 of those losses to offset ordinary income on their tax return. Any remaining net short-term or long-term capital loss is then carried forward to offset future capital gains. I think that provides us with a great summary of the investments and how they get taxed. For viewers who are interested, Elizabeth, can you explain to us where they can find their yearly investment income? Of course. An investment's interest in dividend income, as well as the related tax status, sales proceeds, and adjusted cost basis are generally displayed on various Form 1099s. If your investments are located at a brokerage firm, such as Edward Jones, you may receive a consolidated Form 1099 combining various 1099 forms in one document. These consolidated 1099s are generally made available to taxpayers between mid-February to mid-March, but can vary depending upon the investments within the account. Thanks for explaining that, Elizabeth. As people begin to file their 2023 tax returns, is there anything specific that should be on their radar when it comes to investments on their returns? Sandy, I'm happy to answer this one. Given the increase in interest rates over 2023, some clients may find themselves surprised at how high interest income on their tax return is this year. While taxpayers have certainly benefited from the higher interest rates on cash, CDs, and fixed income, they may not be so excited about that tax bill. However, it's important to remember that higher taxes on investment income generally means that those investments performed well in a year and that the benefits of that performance will exceed the cost of the resulting taxes. All right, that's good to know. Before we discuss some planning opportunities, let's talk about the why. Can you explain the benefits of tax planning when it comes to investments? Of course. 
Whenever we have returns on our investments, such as interest, dividends, or capital gains, the actual amount of those returns that we may get to keep may be significantly lower once you factor in both federal and state taxes. That's why it's so important to consider tax implications when factoring in your realized returns and discussing them with a qualified tax professional. Proper tax management can help mitigate the impact of those taxes, which can allow you to keep as much of your returns as possible. However, if you really want to maximize the benefits of tax planning, it's best to manage taxes year-round as opposed to just during tax season or at year-end. Dan, thank you. I think that gives us a really good understanding of why proper year-round tax planning can be so beneficial. However, I think it's time to address the question on everyone's mind, and that's how. What are some of the strategies we can think about throughout the year to help keep as much of our returns as possible? Of course. Elizabeth and I can really outline some strong tax management strategies. First, let's start off with interest income, since I mentioned higher interest rates in 2023. Now, depending on your tax rate and or state you live in, it might make sense to consider investing in a municipal bond, since their interest is not subject to federal and potentially state tax. To decide if municipal bonds are right for you, investors often compare the yield on the municipal bond to the after-tax yield on a corporate bond. This comparison, known as the taxable equivalent yield, can help compare the returns after taxes are factored in. Another great strategy to minimize taxes is to hold investments long-term instead of buying and selling frequently. Avoiding high turnover in your portfolio can help classify dividends as qualified while helping minimize taxes on capital gains by qualifying them as long-term instead of short-term. This means that your dividends and capital gains may be taxed at your long-term capital gains tax rate, which as Dan mentioned earlier, is typically lower than your marginal tax rate applicable to non-qualified dividends and net short-term capital gains. That's a great point, Elizabeth. I'd also like to mention one more tax management strategy, and that's tax loss harvesting, which is when you sell some of your investments at a loss to offset current or future capital gains. This means if you have gains from the sale of one investment, we can sell other investments at a loss and reduce some or completely offset that gain. Let's walk through a quick example before we dig into the details of tax loss harvesting. Let's say a taxpayer earning $150,000 in wages during the year sells an investment and the result is a long-term capital gain of $10,000. Without any other losses, the taxpayer will pay federal taxes on that gain of 15% plus any additional state taxes. However, if we are able to sell another investment for a $10,000 loss, we won't owe any taxes on the initial gain of $10,000, saving at least $1,500. But that amount can be even larger if the initial sale had been a short-term capital gain, as the taxpayer's federal marginal tax rate would be larger than the capital gains tax rate of 15%. Dan, it seems like tax loss harvesting can be a great way to reduce taxes. However, one question really pops into my head. Which investments would you recommend selling at a loss, and are there trade-offs we should consider before har harvesting losses? That's a really important consideration, and there are certainly good investments to consider when harvesting, as well as investments that might not be so appropriate. Good candidates for tax loss harvesting are generally investments that no longer fit your investment strategy, have poor investment prospects, or can be easily substituted with other investments. However, loss harvesting is not always appropriate. Investments that are not as suitable for loss harvesting may include investments that are suitable to your other goals, such as included within your portfolio for diversification purposes, and investments within pre-tax accounts, such as a retirement account or HSA. Now, Elizabeth also mentioned potential trade-offs when considering loss harvesting, and there's one key consideration that comes to mind, the wash sale rule. If a security is purchased 30 days before or after the sale of a substantially identical security, the sale is considered a wash sale, and any realized loss from the sale cannot be claimed by the client on their tax return. This means that violating the wash sale rule can prevent you from offsetting your capital gains. Now, using our previous example, a wash sale rule violation would, be, would result in the taxpayer still paying in that 15% long-term capital gains tax rate, plus any state tax. Finally, when considering loss harvesting, Remember that selling an investment takes you out of the market of that investment for at least 30 days if you're following the wash sale rule. If your goal is to harvest a loss while maintaining market exposure, you can consider buying a security in the same asset class within that 30-day period, so long as the security is not substantially identical. 
Dan, these are great points to think about when considering loss harvesting. However, I also want to bring up opportunities to gains harvest. This is when you recognize a gain on the sale of securities to incur a smaller amount of tax on that sale. It may seem contradictory that harvesting capital gains can actually save taxes, but if you have large capital loss carry forward, or you're in a lower capital gains tax bracket than usual, recognizing gains can allow you to sell securities with realized gains without paying as much tax on them. For example, if we harvested 10,000 of capital losses in 2023, we would be allowed to use 3,000 to offset 2023 wages, but then have $7,000 in losses carried into 2024. Then in 2024, we could recognize 7,000 in gains without incurring additional taxes. You both have provided some really great insight on how taxpayers can manage their investments in a tax efficient manner. Thank you both so much for joining me today and for sharing all of this valuable information ahead of tax season. Well, as I mentioned earlier, we have several resources that we hope will help you during this time. Be sure to check them out by going to the resource icon on your screen. We're now going to start the Q&A portion of the program. We have a team of subject matter experts waiting online to answer your questions through the Q&A widget. Remember, Edward Jones, its employees and financial advisors cannot provide tax advice. You should consult a qualified tax advisor regarding your specific situation. Also note, there will not be any video during this portion. You will only see a slide prompting you that the Q&A is now in session. Rest assured, the webinar is still live. We will do our best to answer your questions during the allotted time. If your question is not answered, please follow up with your Edward Jones financial advisor or your qualified tax professional. If you do not have an Edward Jones financial advisor, please click on the Find an FA widget below. I also want to remind you that this broadcast will be available again on demand using the same link you used to register for today's program. Please note our upcoming webinar as well. Thanks again for joining us and please enjoy the rest of your day.